Well, good afternoon. Um, a little while ago, uh, I purchased a new mobile phone. And on getting the phone home, taking it out of the box, removing that lovely cellophane wrapping from the front cover, I was pretty disappointed to hear that actually it was going to take up to 24 hours before I was going to be able to use my new handset on the mobile network. Now, in this modern age of instant gratification, that's quite a disappointing thing to be told. Mobile phone companies belong to what we call service industries. And we've all used organizations within those industries before. So we've applied for a bank account, a credit card, a utility bill, a mobile phone. And our experience of using those kinds of organizations is sometimes that we have to wait quite a long time to speak to somebody. It's quite difficult in terms of, of dealing with them. They make mistakes that we sometimes have to point out. And they seem to be not totally listening to what we're saying, but they're wrestling with systems that are running a bit slowly today. We've heard that quite a lot. What I want to talk about today is how, within the service industries, we're restricting our opportunities for growth because of the way that we're using people and the way that we're using human talent. And I want to talk about how we can use human talent in a better way and learn the lessons from other industries to try and improve the way that those particular types of service are delivered. Productivity is a really useful concept. So I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining how it gets measured and what it means before we talk about that process of when I got my phone. So productivity measures how much output one unit of input can create in one unit, in one unit of time. So I could produce so many widgets in one hour, and that would measure my productivity. And it's a fundamental cornerstone of our growth, both economically and as a society. Okay? So if we can increase our productivity, what it means is we can deliver things faster. Okay? It means we can deliver more things in the same period of time. It reduces prices, it increases wages, it increases the standard of living, and it lifts people out of poverty. That's the, the effect and the impact of increasing productivity and why governments around the world are trying to go and do that and harness it. What's really interesting is if you look at the figures for productivity, look at a sector such as uh, manufacturing of transport, car vehicles. They've increased their productivity since 2009 by 58%, a massive increase. But if we look at financial services and insurance, since 2009, so in the same period, productivity has fallen by 10%. Okay? So in banking, in financial services, in insurance, we're actually going backwards. Things are getting more expensive. They're taking longer to, produ to produce and provide. And we're getting a, a worse service as a result. Let's go back to that mobile phone uh, purchase that I made. You'd think, wouldn't you, that if when I bought my mobile phone, it would be a very slick, very technologically enabled experience. And the reason it takes 24 hours is because it's very, very complex uh, technologically to do that. Well, you'd be wrong. The reason my phone takes 24 hours to activate on the network is because it's a very complex process involving, actually, lots and lots of people. Some of them are all, all over the world. So there's people in India, there may be people in South America, people in Europe, people in Britain who've all got a part to play in that process. And some of them are on the phone speaking to you, the customer. Some of them are giving you advice. They're listening to what you want. They're advising you on the right product for you. And they're taking your order. And that's great. They're the kind of humanistic skills that we want. But other people in that process are doing things like activating your SIM card. They're doing things like creating your account and sending you a letter. Basically, they're working these mundane, repetitive tasks doing the same thing over and over again. And first of all, is that something that humans are good at? Not really. Errors start to creep into the process. We do things inconsistently. And thirdly, is it something we can scale very easily? A lot of people probably try and put their new SIM card in on Christmas Day, which means that it takes me a long time to get to the end of that queue in terms of having my phone activated. And that's why it takes 24 hours. So I'm interested to know what lessons we can learn from other uh, sectors who have used automation over the years to improve their productivity and to use humans in a more effective way. So we're all familiar with these kinds of images. 
Even way back in the Industrial Revolution, we used machinery to replicate previously human, manual, laborious activities and to scale that up massively beyond what people could do. And that created a lot of wealth, a lot of productivity, uh, and helped to move organizations uh, and helped to move society on. In car manufacturing, I can now order a car from a massive list of extras. I can choose my own colored wheels, my own colored paint. I can put a, a flag on the roof if I want to. And all of that is achieved because we've automated a lot of those repetitive processes on the production line. I get my car faster, it's cheaper than it used to be, and I can even track it as it goes through the process. And then even in retailing, the reason that we can get our products the next day or within an hour in some uh, types of organization, in some circumstances, is because we've scaled up that kind of retailing uh, and warehousing uh, approach through robotics and through automation to do things at the kind of scale that people wouldn't be able to achieve. Okay? Having 10 times as many people in the warehouse doesn't mean you get your order 10 times quicker. It just means they trip into each other and, 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 and get in each other's way a bit more. So what lessons can we learn from other industries that are being more productive and reapply to those service industries? Well, technology is advancing all the time and advancing very quickly. Just picking something like the autonomous vehicle, we've all heard of these driverless cars, okay? What's really interesting about that is in 2007, the US military sponsored what was called the DARPA Challenge, okay? And the DARPA Challenge challenged inventors to invent an autonomous car that could drive a 150-mile course through the Mojave Desert. None of the cars finished. In fact, the furthest any of the cars got on that course was seven miles, okay? That was in 2007. And now in 2015, we have trucks driving themselves, we have cars driving themselves. Some of you may even have a car that can park itself, okay? That's the pace at which and the speed at which these kinds of technologies are evolving. And we're even using automation in the home. This is an example of a, of a robotic vacuum cleaner, okay? And we also have similar things that cut our grass. Why are we interested in embracing automation in the home? None of us want to do mundane, repetitive, manual activities. We'd rather use our minds and our skills to take ourselves on, to spend time with our families, to learn new skills, to go out and enjoy the world. We don't want to be sat at home laboriously, repeatedly hoovering the, uh, uh, the house, okay? And that's why these things are successful and people use them. Why would we go and do this kind of activity when a robot could do that task for us? So let's go back to that process that I looked at and compare it with some of those technologies that we've seen that are being used in, in different industries, in our homes, in our cars, and see what's going on. This is a typical office, okay? So when I put my SIM card in my phone, a few hours later, my request ended up on somebody's desk in this office. And it looks a little bit like a factory with a lot of people working in it. And some of those people are on the phone. Some of those people are talking to customers. They're using their human skills like empathy, uh, advice, knowledge, uh, understanding, and decision making to offer customers value and to help them with what they're trying to do. But because regulatory requirements and compliance and, and new products are being launched all the time and processes are getting more complex, a lot of these people are actually just spending time doing the same process all day, every day. Effectively, we're treating people a bit like robots in this kind of environment. It's really interesting. There's two, um, two professors at the London School of Economics, Mary Latterty and uh, Leslie Wilcox, and they're writing a book about um, how service uh, industries could benefit from software robots and automation. And they use a really interesting phrase. They talk about taking the robot out of the human, okay? So looking at the people in this kind of environment, saying, what are the skills and talents that we can use these people for, and what are the skills and talents that we can use automation technology to apply to and get benefits from both? But the question is, why are people in this environment performing these processes? Why aren't we using technology? Why haven't we got systems that do all this for us and, and use people on the phone all the time? Why does it take 24 hours? Well, this is the perception of what the people in that office are doing. We think that we're using people for their skills of interaction, judgment, 
interpretation, all the great things that people are good at. And then we think that we use technology to add a layer of repetition, rules, consistency, and scale to that people layer, okay? And that forms our business process. What actually happens is that as the regulator requires us to do things differently, we have to comply with different laws and legislation and different rules, we launch new products, we grow our business and, and, and want to serve more people, we end up starting to use people more and more in that technology part. We can't change the technology as quickly as we can change our business or as quickly as we can change our laws. Some of these systems were put in place in the 70s, in the 80s. They're really old. And changing them is a very risky thing to do. So it's much easier to use people to get the changes to the system by doing it robotically and manually than it is to take the risk of amending the system and, and changing the technology. That's quite a difficult thing to do. What that means, of course, is we're not actually using people for the skills that we employed them for in the first place. We're kind of using them as robots to do these repeatable uh, manual uh, activities. So my question would be, how can we readdress the balance? How can we harness people's talents better and get a better front end of our process so we ring up for, for, for some service in, you know, from our bank, for our mobile phone provider? How can we ensure that we get better value from the people we're talking to and that they're not wrestling with the system or that we're not on hold or that we're not waiting a long time and that our productivity can increase like with those other industries? What if we could deploy some of those automation approaches that we saw in, auto in, in the automotive industry and in retailing? What if we could redeploy those into the office environment? What would a robot look like in the office? Well, the first thing to say is don't imagine something that's got robot arms and legs and is sitting at a swivel chair alongside his colleague working the computer. Think of something a bit more like the playerless piano. So you've got the same instrument, you've got the same piece of music, but you've trained the piano to play that piece of music and then you can take the player away from the keyboard. Well, the same principle applies with the kinds of processes that these people are doing in the office. What it does is it takes the mundane, the repetitive, the robot-like activities away from the person and it allows them to focus on the skills that they have, the management, the decisioning, the empathy, the knowledge uh, uh, base that they have, uh, the decision-making that they can do. If we could apply that same technique and that same technology into the office, we could take a lot of those mundane activities, automate them, increase our productivity and scale at what we do. But don't just think about one robot, one automation, Think about a virtual workforce, okay? Think about humans working alongside their virtualized, automated counterparts. And from a management perspective, you look at a piece of work, you look at a process, and you say, is this a repeatable, robotic, rules-based process that I can give to my virtual workforce? Or is it a skilled, humanistic-style process that I can give to my human workforce? If I can start dividing work up in that way, what it allows me to do is put more people talking to customers, making decisions using empathy and skills, and not have to use them in those factory-like back offices doing that repetitive uh, processing. So what are the advantages of this approach? Well, there are benefits for everyone. From the consumer perspective, you get your products faster, you get them more consistently, you get fewer errors, you get to speak to people, and the organization that you're working with gives you better products. From the employee's perspective, you're more valued as an employee. You're actually using your skills and using your talents, and you're being used for your humanistic abilities, not the fact that you can do the same process 50 times a day, the same time every day, okay? So there are lots and lots of benefits from a humanistic perspective, and that also increases your value to the organization. From the perspective of the organization, they get more consistency, they can scale better, they can deliver better products faster to market, and they can increase their size and their productivity uh, in line with those other industries that we saw. So if we go back to that original uh, slide that we saw when I talked about the original process, when I put the new SIM card in my phone, it was taking a long time. Remember that 24-hour process? Lots of people all around the world, not necessarily adding value, but, but going through these robotic, repeatable processes. What would that look like with a virtual workforce working alongside that human workforce? Well, this time, I might get my phone activated instantly. 
Instead of waiting on hold to get through to an advisor, I might get through straight away. There will be more people available to help me to decide which particular handset I want to get, to decide which tariff suits my usage pattern, and to make sure I get it more quickly. And then behind the scenes, for that repeatable side, that repeatable processing element, I'm using my virtual workforce to deliver my products much more quickly. So less errors are creeping into the process. I'm more reliable in terms of what I'm delivering. And my human workforce can use their personal talents and skills to deliver better value to those customers. I think we're wasting human talent. I think redeploying human talent as robots in these centers to do back office processing because our technology can't keep up is a waste of that human talent. And I think if we're smart about the way that we learn lessons from other organizations and other sectors like manufacturing and like retail, and if we can get automation working in partnership with the humans, we can grow our skills, we can grow our organizations, we can become more productive, and we can harness those talents as opposed to wasting them uh, and, and gain better products, better skills, and better standards of living as a result of that. Thank you very much. <laughs>